Uh, good morning. My, I'm Michael Green. I'm the clerk of Green's List. I have to start with an apology. Our chairman this morning was um, <clears throat> to be our the senior property law member of the list, Namal Wickrama SC. He's just, he rang me as I was um, walking up the street to say that his car has not started from him, for him and uh, as he's just spent $5,000 on it, he is fuming. So Namal does apologise for not being here. And he gave me a bit of his introduction, which was far more eloquent than you're going to hear from me. Mine will be very practical. Now, our first present presenter this morning, it is property law, as you know. Um, our first presenter is Sam Hopper. Sam's uh, been in practice for now coming up about 10 years and been at the bar about seven years. Sam has a commercial practice, which is predominantly, or the major portion of his commercial practice is in property law. And hence, he uh, brings a, a great deal of expertise to what he's going to speak to us about this morning. The paper you've got there from Sam is a very comprehensive paper, Retail Leases Update, Assignments, Repairs, Maintenance and Market Reviews, or Market Rent Reviews. Um, but I think the major part of Sam's presentation this morning will be on set off and rent payable without deduction. Some of the other topics in his paper he will touch on, but maybe go through, not go through as fully, and therefore he leaves you with this very comprehensive paper to fully read at your own leisure. Sam Hopper. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Um, you might have noticed already I'm a touch husky, and that could be something of an understatement. Um, I, uh, I actually lost my voice earlier in the week, and it's come back over the last 24 hours, so if you can be as patient with me as you can, I'd appreciate it. It reminds me, though, losing my voice, of the first brief I ever got, which was um, uh, some uh, a claim for make good costs after termination of a lease, and Michael Green sent the the, uh, the brief through to me at about 4.30 the day before the trial, which should set off a warning bell in anybody's book. <clears throat> and I worked up the papers and got home at about 11 o'clock that night, walked in the door to say hello to my wife, and um, instead of saying, hello, honey, I'm home, I went, ah, and I had completely lost my voice. It might have had something to do with the terror, the sheer terror of my first trial. And anyway, I, I rang around some friends from the reader's course, which was a pretty futile exercise because I didn't have any voice. Finally, I got one who uh, got, got, a, got onto a mate who could, uh, could hear me, and he agreed to, uh, to come and speak for me while I told him, sat, sat beside him at the bar table and told him what to say. And when we, uh, when we appeared at court, he got to announce the best appearance that I've ever heard, and I'm kicking myself that I didn't get to say it myself. He got up and he said, Your Honour, my name's Gillard, uh, and I kind of appear for the plaintiff, uh, but I don't have a brief. My learned friend, Mr Hopper, sitting beside me, um, he's got a brief, but he hasn't got a voice. And between the two of us, Your Honour, we make up a whole barrister. <laughs> now, um, as Michael said, I've given you a paper that's, um, that Michael's politely described as a, a comprehensive paper on, uh, on an update on commercial and retail leasing. Uh, I'd describe it in a more disparaging fashion as a hodgepodge of... Um, of issues that have come across my desk over the last couple of years and that I think might be relevant or useful to, for people who practice in this area. But uh, there's a lot of material in there. I, I won't touch on the bulk of it. I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about a case that's currently reserved by the full federal court uh, that was heard late last... Well, it was heard by the full federal court on uh, the 2nd of March and that was... Um, uh, heard by Justice Finkelstein, uh, an appeal from a decision by Justice Finkelstein in December. And it's to do with a, um, a managed investment scheme, <coughs> but it gives rise to, excuse me, <coughs> it gives rise to a leasing issue that I think is relevant to uh, a very large number of leasing, uh, leasing disputes. Now, the case was involving the Forest Enterprise Australia Managed Investment Scheme. Um, some of you might remember it as the Tasmanian Plantations Managed Investment Scheme, which was uh, a timber um, uh, plantation scheme that started in Tasmania and moved its way across uh, uh, the north of Australia as well. And the case involved... There was a lot of argy-bargy about um, what, in fact, was the leasehold structure of the scheme, but basically it's a... Um, a, managing, a trust based managed investment scheme built on a leasehold structure. And to make it a little bit easier to understand, I've prepared a very highly sophisticated drawing on the whiteboard. 
there are four relevant entities in the case. The top of the diagram here is, is uh, I'll put, uh, describe it as TASP, that's Tasmanian Plantations, and that's the land hold, a land owning company within the group. Beneath that is a subsidiary company called FEA, and beneath that, helpfully, is another subsidiary company called FEAP. And FEAP is um, the responsible entity or trustee of the schemes, um, and the beneficiary of the schemes are the growers who are down the bottom here with a whole lot of arrows pointing towards them. And the way the, the leasehold structure worked was Tasmanian Plantations granted a head lease to FEA, FEA granted a sublease to FEAP, who was also a responsible entity and trustee, and then FEAP granted a series of subleases to each of the growers um, and that, who, who also had rights as beneficiaries. Now, the group collapsed. When the group collapsed, the first three companies went into liquidation. But importantly, as well as going into liquidation, receivers and managers were appointed to the top two companies. And in order to try and um, the, the receivers and managers uh, latched onto what was obviously the most valuable asset in this structure, which is the freehold at the top of the tr top of the tree. Now they, of course, wanted to sell the freehold unencumbered. So they wanted to get rid of all the leases below. Now, they would quite easily be able to dispose of this leasehold interest here. The challenge was getting rid of this leasehold interest here, which would inevitably extinguish the growers' rights down here. So they sought, they served notices and sought to terminate that lease for non-payment of rent. And because they are receivers and managers, they've got the ability to go to uh, the court and um, obtain protection by seeking judicial advice. And they asked the court, are we justified as receivers and managers in terminating these leases for non-payment of rent? Now, the administrators, who although appointed to all the companies, were relevantly acting for this company here, um, we also had duties to my clients who are the growers down here. Now, this company, and this is where some of the complexities of the case get a little bit um, twisty-turny, but this company, because it has certain obligations, uh, uh, has a, an Australian Financial Services Licence under the Corporations Act, it um, has certain financial hurdles that it has to overcome in order to obtain its licence. One of the ways it overcame that hurdle was um, to obtain what was described as a letter of comfort from um, another company within the group saying that, it, that, that another company in the group with more assets than it had would answer debts up to some millions of dollars on a month by month basis if and when required. Helpfully for my clients, the growers, that letter of comfort just happened to have come from FEA which is the company that was um, alleging that the, uh, the, the, the uh, alleging rental arrears and trying to terminate the lease. So, I'll return to my lectern. The administrators said, well, we'll make a call on that, that letter and you ask for, we'll call it a million dollars worth of rent, uh, but we'll just ask you under the letter of comfort for that million dollars worth of rent back and will cross a line through the debts, they'll set each other off. Now, the, there were, again, you can imagine the sort of arguments that were coming up about the characterisation of the letter of comfort and, and whether it was a contractually enforceable document or whether it was just a, a, a unilateral, you know, a, an unenforceable um, representation. But um, the, the relevant part of the case for, for our purposes today was that the lease between FEA and FEAP said that FEAP would pay rent without deduction. It didn't say any more. It said they'll pay rent without deduction. Now, um, I presume most of the people here are property lawyers, so you'll be familiar with the various um, 
forms that a rental covenant will take. Sometimes you just pay the rent, sometimes you pay the rent without deduction, sometimes you pay the rent without any deduction whatsoever, sometimes you pay the rent without any deduction, set off, counterclaim, cross claim or of any kind. The interesting part of this case was that it was limited to those words without deduction and there was nothing more and importantly there was no express reference to a set off. Yet it was a uh, a set-off that the administrators were claiming. Now, in Victoria in the um, mid-90s, there was a decision of a single judge in the Supreme Court that said that um, the words... Oh, in fact, I'll go back a step first. It is possible to contract out of a right to claim an equitable set-off. But there's, a bit, there's some controversy in the cases over the precise wording that's required to contract out of it. There was a single judge decision from the Supreme Court of Victoria that held that the words without deduction on their own are sufficient. There was also a decision of Deputy President McNamara to, in VCAT to the same effect. Um, however, in, the, uh, in around 2002, there was an unreported uh, application for an injunction that recognised that there might be an arguable case on the point and there was a decision from the New Zealand High Court and, a New Zeal uh, and from the English Court of Appeal saying that the words without deduction are not sufficient to contract out of an equitable set-off and you have to expressly refer to a set-off in order to exclude it. Um, there are also a couple of other decisions, including a, a, a Western Australian decision, recent decision that recognised the controversy. Now, all of these decisions were put before Justice Finkelstein, who said that um, if, if it were up to him, he would for, his, his view is that the words without deduction are sufficiently clear to exclude an equitable set-off. But... He, but he, in his view, he was bound, and he used the word bound, interestingly, he was bound by appeal court decisions from New Zealand and England, even though there are none in Australia, to conclude that, um, that you, you need the additional words or set off within your rental clause to expressly exclude the equitable set off. The decision went on appeal, three judges of the full federal court, as I said, it was heard on the 2nd of March, Court is still reserved and we've got no word as to when the decision's coming down, but it will be the first uh, appeal court decision on this point within Australia. And although strictly not binding in Victoria, a full federal court decision is obviously highly persuasive on a Victorian court. Now, um, the th obvious thought a lot of you might be having now is, well, how is this going to be relevant to um, a, an ordinary retail leasing or commercial landlord-tenant dispute that doesn't have the complexities of a case like this? The answer is it's actually one of the most important issues that comes up in most um, landlord-tenant um, disputes over the termination of a lease that, I, that, that, I, that at least that come across my desk. There's, there's four ways that you terminate, that, that, that you resist the termination of a lease. So you're acting for a tenant. The first way is you challenge the formalities of the notice. Not a particularly, um, uh, it's a fairly short term strategy, but one that can work. Second thing is you can attack the, the factual substrate behind the notice. You say, no, I'm not in rental arrears, or no, I didn't breach, whatever it happens to be. The third way is you, um, you seek relief from forfeiture by curing the breach, paying the arrears, and seeking the benevolent, uh, and throwing yourself at the mercy of the court. Well, the fourth, which is by far the most um, common in my experience, is you you come up with a counterclaim, particularly when the landlord is trying to terminate for non-payment of rent. Come up with a counterclaim that is equal to or exceeds uh, in uh, the amount of um, rental arrears that are being claimed. Now, because um, because of the special nature of a lease, you've got to. If you're using that fourth strategy, you, ha you can't just run any old counterclaim in order to prevent your landlord from terminating the lease. If you've got, say you've got um, a complex, you know, a, a, an ongoing relationship with your landlord and you say, uh, I'm, I've fallen into rental arrears, I'm 100,000 behind, um, 
uh, and it's for occupying a, a building in a, a, a in our premises in Owen Dixon West, but um, you're also uh, warehousing some of my goods in West Melbourne, and um, because of the way, you're, because of your negligence in warehousing those goods over there, you owe me $150,000. So I'll set that off against the rent. That doesn't work because the rental covenant and the ability to terminate the lease for non-payment of rent is part of the landlord's security under the rental uh, under the lease itself. So to defend to to raise a counterclaim as a set-off against rent, it has to be an equitable set-off. That means there has to be an intimate relationship between the nature of your um, your rental, uh, of your counterclaim and the lease itself. They either have to arise out of the same transaction or they have to be so intimately connected as, so as the, the counterclaim has to be so intimately connected to the rent as to render it unconscionable for the landlord to enforce the rental covenant without first dealing with the the counterclaim. The classic case of a landlord's of a of a counterclaim causing an equitable set-off is in the retail shopping context. The landlord, the tenant's fallen into arrears, call it a hundred thousand dollars. Landlord goes to terminate the the, the um, tenant says, well, I was um, the recipient of representations by the landlord or the landlord's agents about the number of people that were going to f walk, walk past this, this airlock-like automatic door every day. You told me it was going to be 5,000 people an hour. In fact, it's five people an hour. I relied on that representation. I entered into the lease. In reliance on those representations, I've, I've exposed myself to all of, these re all of this rent that I can't afford to pay. So it's your, it's your misrepresentation that causes my impecuniosity and my in inability to pay rent. And that's the sort of case that you run against, uh, against a landlord who's trying to terminate for non-payment of rent. Now, if you say, it, if, if um, Justice Finkelstein's decision is upheld and the words without deduction are not sufficient to contract out of a set-off, then um, anyone with those words in, the, in their lease can run the, the, the sort of argument that I'm talking about. However, if his decision is overturned and the words without deduction on their own are sufficient to exclude an equitable set-off, then any, any tenant who has, the, who has a lease with those words in the rental covenant is going to find it extremely difficult to run an equitable set-off in the nature of the claim I've just outlined to resist an attempt to terminate the lease. Now, to illustrate why I think that's important, until about three or four months ago, the Law Institute standard lease contained the words without deduction, but didn't expressly refer to an equitable set-off. And a very large number of um, of uh, um, of precedents around Melbourne, um, at Melbourne at least, and probably around Australia, had the same the same thing. They included the words without deduction. They didn't include an express reference to the word set off. So we'll wait and see what the full federal court has to say. But it, uh, whichever way it goes, it has the potential to have a significant impact on uh, a number of of landlord and tenant disputes around the country. In the meantime, um, the, uh, the question is what should you guys be doing as um, lawyers who are, um, uh, excuse me, who are settling or reviewing leases. Uh, and I think the prudent thing is this, if you're acting for a landlord, you should always check the rental covenant to make sure there is an express reference to um, an exclusion of a right to claim set off in the in the rental covenant. Uh, that can be, it only requires a couple of words. Uh, usually the rent is payable without deduction, just put in the words or set off. And in fact, or equitable set off is even better. If on the other hand, you're acting for a tenant, uh, look in the rental covenant for the same, uh, the same phenomenon. If there is an exclusion in the rental covenant of um, the right to claim an equitable, equitable set-off. It is prudent to firstly advise your tenant of the risks of that of that those words being in the lease, because that can be very damaging down the track. And secondly, so far as it is possible, and there's always limits to this, you should try and negotiate with the landlord to exclude those words. 
The problem when it comes to a negotiation, of course, is that um, landlords would be wary to remove the words from, um, from the rental covenant because it allows the rogue tenant to obtain um, uh, leverage against the landlord. Alternatively, uh, a, a tenant's reluctant to have the words in there because, of course, it allows a rogue landlord to take advantage of his own abuse in the event that you do have a legitimate counter, uh, set off counterclaim. All right, that's, the, that's really the main point that I wanted to, to raise with you today. It's a very long explanation for what is a very, ultimately a very short point, and I'll repeat it, that is check your rental covenant and make sure that you're aware of the importance of the words set off in that uh, following the words without deduction, usually in clause two of your lease. Um, I'll just grab a copy of my paper. Um, I'm, I've only got five minutes to go. Um, in fact, that's not my paper. Have you got my paper? Um, perhaps I'll... Thank you. Um, if the, uh, I might start by asking if anybody's got any questions on arising out of that topic. I'm never sure whether no questions is a good or a bad sign. Could also mean that no one can hear my voice at the back of the room, but... Okay, as, as I said, short, long, long, long explanation for a fairly short point. Um, the, other, the other topics in my paper, and I'm aware of the lack of time, are assignments, repair and maintenance, and current market rent reviews. Um, again, does anybody have any particular questions on that area that they'd like to address to me now? Otherwise, I'll pick a few random points that I'll make out of the paper that I think are important. All right, if you turn to... Repair and maintenance is probably the hottest issue under the Retail Leases Act. Um, the, first, um, the first topic, starting on page nine, or first subtopic, is determining the condition of the premises under section 52 of the Retail Leases Act. Now, unlike most rental covenants you see in leases, section 52 implies into all retail leases uh, a covenant that the landlord will maintain the premises in a condition consistent with the premises at the commencement of the lease. Or in fact, when the, when the lease was entered into, which is a defined term under the Act. Now, that's what we call a keep in repair and not a put in repair covenant. For a long time, uh, it's one of those typical retail leasing concepts, easy to say and very hard to enforce because uh, when you have a brand new property, it's very easy to um, it creates a very clear benchmark as to what the condition of the property is. But when you have a property that is in a steady state of decay, as you know, many properties are around town, um, it's very difficult to say um, what the condition of the property was when the lease was entered into. Is the landlord obliged, for example, to um, uh, repair, uh, repair the roof to... If the roof starts to leak very badly, but was leaking only a little bit when the lease was entered into, is the landlord required to improve the roof so that it only leaks a little bit, or is he entitled to, or is he required to uh, completely fix the roof? Now, in the recent case of Computer and Parts Land and Ost China Yan Tai Proprietary Limited, senior member Lothian went to some length to try and explain the um, operation of the, of the section. Um, one of the the, the... the points that she makes in the decision, um, some of them I think are intuitively correct, some of them I have a bit more difficulty with. And they're listed at paragraph 44 of the paper, which is on page 10. Now, the first interesting point is that Subparagraph so A, the decision suggests that the tenant's knowledge of any defects in the premises is not relevant to the operation of section 52. It's an important one for practitioners. Um, if there's a defect that your tenant is not aware of when they enter into possession of the property, they might be stuck with it. So um, to the extent that it's possible, it's uh, prudent to, to um, advise your, your tenant clients to, have a, a, to thoroughly inspect the premises before entering into a lease. The second one I have a bit more difficulty with. In this particular case, um, the landlord and tenant... The, the roof was defective and the landlord and tenant had actually entered into a separate agreement to upgrade 
the roof after the lease was commenced, uh, which meant that although the um, roof was in a particular condition when the lease was entered into, there was a collateral agreement to improve it. Um, the, the, the member found that the condition of the premises for the purpose of section 52 is determined by reference to what was in fact demised, and that makes perfect sense, but also from the intention of the parties. Now, um, that's a fairly difficult concept. I won't labour it too hard other than to say it just seems to be inconsistent with section 52 of the Act, which is um, a section you can't contract out of. Um, the third point, subsection C, the landlord didn't have an obligation to put the premises um, into, um, uh, uh, to put the premises into a particular state of repair under section 52. Um, and the fourth point, he's not obliged to redesign or improve the premises. However, the final point, uh, sorry, point E, which is also important, is that um, Sometimes the obligation to repair can, in extreme circumstances, mean replacement if it's the only way to continue uh, to keep um, the particular item of uh, plant or equipment working. In that particular case, it was an air conditioner. Landlords said the air, air conditioners um, deteriorate. Uh, tenants said the air conditioner is deteriorating, um, and the, uh, the the landlord said, "Well, I can patch it up and keep repairing it because that's consistent with the condition of the premises when the lease was entered into." Uh, the member said, eventually, you might have to replace it. You don't have to improve it, you only have to replace like with like, but eventually, decay gets to such a point where it has to be replaced. Um, I see the time there. Uh, so, unless anyone's thought of any other questions they want to raise with me. Ah, I have one. I do. Um, in relation to the new disclosure statement, yes. and particularly Tasmania, uh, Tasmania, sorry, New South Wales and Queensland, where franchisors are caught under the acts in those jurisdictions, um, in circumstances where the franchise law will need to give the franchisee a disclosure statement in its current form, what would you recommend with respect to the situation where we can't get a current disclosure statement from the landlord because they refuse to give us one, and then you're required to give one to your franchisee and you've got, you've got to fill in details about the premises, for example, that the franchise law won't know, yeah. being who the anchor tenants are, all the information that's required. Do you just kind of skip over it and say, that, we don't have that info? That, I, I'm Complete, that's a really big problem with new disclosure statements. Um, the, um, it, uh, that's the first time I've heard someone raise it in the context of a franchise law, but it's, it's a perfectly relevant Sorry, it's very point. relevant to my practice. Yeah, because we also see it in the context of an assign or of a lease. Yeah. Um, and section, section 62 of the Retail Leases Act creates a very powerful protection for assign ors of a lease because it creates a, um, it releases them from any of lingering liability, both the assignor and the guarantor, which under common law and the terms of most assignment deeds, they remain um, liable for the, for the, assigning, the assignee's breaches. But in order to satisfy, in order to fill out the, uh, to, to trigger section 62, you've got to fill out the disclosure statement, which has things about anchor tenant, and in fact the back of my paper has the disclosure statement in it. Um, and Far more comprehensive now. It, it, it also it also asks them for um, landlords' representations. Yeah, and how's a how's a tenant going to know that? Do we just have to watch the space and wait to see I, what happens? The, I think the only thing, the only thing you can do is, in the assigning tenants' circumstances, the best strategy I know of is to write to the landlord, tell them what you intend to do, ask them to give you a disclosure statement, and tell them you're going to rely on it. And to the extent that the landlord fails to disclose or misleadingly discloses, it's the landlord who's going to be suing you for the assignee's breaches. So you'll raise an estoppel argument against them. But you're talking about a disclosure to your franchisee, Which and the franchisee to is then going to complain to you, and you're going to rely on the landlord's representations in a fight between you and the franchisee. But the franchisor can't compel the landlord to give it a disclosure statement. So the problem I'm facing in my practice is probably ninety percent of the time my clients are franchisors and they don't give disclosure statements to their tenants. Yeah. So they're not going to give me a disclosure statement that says I can't get the information from the landlord, I can't compel the landlord to give it to me, but I have to comply with the obligations to <coughs> disclose under the Act in that new form. Are you assigning the lease at that point or are no. you just granting a sub lease? We're granting a sub we're granting a license to our franchisee, which is, you know, pro probably ninety nine percent of franchisors 
do grant a license as opposed to a sublease. And there's nothing in the code that I'm using. No, so there's nothing, it's one of those loopholes, they sort of yeah. contemplate the franchising relationship, they refer to the franchisor in the Act, yet they don't make it practically helpful for franchisors in the context of trying to comply with their obligation as a licensor or a licensee relationship. I don't know what you can do. Okay. Come on, come and talk to me about our tours. I'll see if we can run something out, but uh, that's it's, it, that's even worse than the problem for a signing tenant. It is, much yeah. worse. And I'm faced with it on a day-to-day -day basis, so... Yeah, and you get, a, you get a difficult landlord and there's nothing you can do. No. Yeah, well, chat to me afterwards or something. Okay. We've got a situation where the uh, building uh, back in the landlord get flooded during the term of the lease, and then the, the tenants been complained, had to shut, as a restaurant, had to shut the business. It wasn't the tenant's fault, because he was a one or two poor flights down, the flood started to bark. So it flooded the whole restaurant. My client, the lease has run out, you know, they bit me and say, well, I'll give you a new lease. And we're saying, and we're saying, we'll give you a new lease, as long as you never, you just wear that, and you, you go forward, you never sort of make a claim against us when you had to close the restaurant. Can you do that as part of my offer lease? Well, lease? I think that might, has he already got an offer? No, no, what I'm saying, the lease has completely come yeah. to an end. So, you know, that bit we can say... Be careful, that might be key on you. Yeah, you reckon you could, like, it's just agree? It, it, it might be that the release is, the rela that the release itself is actually a form of key money. Right. Which is prohibited under the Act, it's actually a fence to the name. Okay. Right. You're, you're for the tenant, did you say? No, the plain law. Um, yeah, you, you want to be careful with it. Key money is, I think it's about 16 or 11 or 13 or something in the end. Yeah. Which is um, considera a, a, a payment or other consideration yeah. for the grant of a lease for which there's no um, other real consideration. Yeah, yeah, okay. And um, I had a situation where uh, um, a landlord and tenant had been arguing about who was responsible for an upgrade to the lift. Yeah. And in that case, the landlord. So the tenant wanted to assign, sought the, the um, landlord's consent to the assignment. The landlord said, I'll only consent to the assignment if you uh, pay for the upgrade to the lift. Yeah, yeah. The tenant okay. said, no. I said, I'll put the money in a trust account and have this really convoluted deed setting out this, this process. <coughs> and when, when, by the time it came to me, I said, look, this is the demand, the, 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 the demand for the repair costs is, is indirect key money. It's an offence. Yeah. We reported him to the commissioner and he eventually wandered off, so just be yeah, quite you. cautious with it. Yeah, Any other questions? All right, I think I'm five minutes over time, so I'll thank you for uh, your patience with my voice and for a copy of my own paper. <laughs>